early in my research, uh, 2018, the state of Illinois uh, did, had a blockchain uh, task force working group, and the PDF is still online. You can you can find it. And so they were talking about different use cases for blockchain, and it went well beyond the finances. Although th their goal is actually that you'll have programmable money, you know, and you'll have money that it's not just usable for anything. But and this is generally understood now within the central bank digital currency discussion. It wasn't at the beginning of the, the lockdowns. Um, but one of the use cases, and this is about uh, managed behavior change, was that they were talking about the state of Illinois, what would happen if you put SNAP benefits on blockchain? Okay, and, and because you would want to ensure wellness, people's wellness. And, and you can see that even at the beginning stages of uh, the, the media discussion of COVID. It was, it's, we're going to be moving towards a wellness and prevention protocol. Right. And so they were already laying the groundwork, especially in black and brown communities, the wellness, right, your, your, your enforced wellness behaviors. And so they would give you SNAP and then they would start to incentivize that you make the healthy choice. Right. And so if you bought the hamburger, it would be full price. But if you bought the apple, then they would ding you a little extra bonus money in your account. Right. And people might look at that and go, oh, well, that seems fair. We want people to be healthy. People should eat good food. But at the same time, it's de it's pull and they had a little diagram for it. Like they showed exactly, here's your digital wallet, here's your, you know, here's your digital citizenship, here's the smart contract, you know, and as we, you know, m more and more over the last couple years, you know, you don't even get a checkout person, right? It's self-checkout. It's already all decided with the barcodes. Um, it, it wasn't taking into account, well, Maybe you live in a food desert. <laughs> um, maybe you work three jobs. Maybe you're living in the back of a car. You know, and then one, like, why is the government telling me what kind of food I'm allowed to have? I mean, there are a number of elements in there. And then also the presumption that at some point they're not going to cut the benefits so that you have to make the right choice to get to the end of the month. Right. Because that's how it always works. They'll be like, oh, well, we cut the budget. Oh, well, look, we, we you know, we have this overage. Well, maybe we won't incentivize it so much. So. It's, it's forcing people into making the good choice among impossible choices. Like to, it's literally could be impossible. And so when I'm, I'm looking at that in terms of these smart contracts and it, you're enforcing behaviors that are actually impossible within smart environments and it's completely dehumanized because you don't have access. Um, so this is going to be linked to what I call pay for success finance. And you know, I'm sort of your ambassador for the, from the city of brotherly love to say that all is not right <laughs> with you know, like our understanding of democracy. Because these things were coming out of Philadelphia and out, out of Wharton Business School and out of something called uh, the Global Impact Investment Network, uh, G-I-I-N, GIN, which is sort of like the genie, GIN. Um, and it, that was set up under the Rockefeller Foundation in the lead up to the last global economic crash. And it was set up by Judith Rodin, who was the former president of University of Pennsylvania. And then she moved on to Rockefeller and got that all set up. And now she, she's moved on again. And there's a new head of Rockefeller. But she rolled all this out. And these impact metrics are connected to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And again, I'm someone who, like, I like riding bikes. I like farmer's markets. I like clean air. I like all these things superficially. On, but they're going to be tied into financial markets that run on data and data analytics and smart environments. So in order to have a clean environment and solve poverty, we'll have to cover everything in smart dust and run it from space and engineer everyone's behavior. I mean, mm. and then that's not okay, right? And so so the, the challenge is, is like threading that needle. Like, yes, no, like I would love to actually have some bike chairs, but I would prefer that it not be linked to my digital identity so you know if I went up the hill on the way home or if I took the easy way around, right? And that's what, sort of where we're going and you have to get in the mindset of how these people think. Um, so the pay for success contracts are essentially linked to things like hunger, poverty, health, education. And what they will do is they will define an optimum behavior and they will predictively profile you against all the ways you will be a burden on society. And they're doing this literally in utero. In 2018, they had the first blockchain baby born in Tanzania. Okay, so they're tracking, they gave the baby a blockchain ID, they gave the mom a blockchain ID, they gave the hospital ID, and then they track the prenatal compliance. And again, I think women should have, you know, access to affordable prenatal care, right? But it should also be care that fits with their 
choice. And I think we all know that there's a lot of different approaches to the birth process now. And so a lot of this was in Africa and tied to global pharmaceutical companies, right? Mm -hmm. And so like then the, at the birth of that baby, that baby is already fixed with the score of the mother's compliance or non-compliance to that established protocol, right? Which again, may or may not be that person's choice, you know, and, and the same with education space, other things, right? Like we don't all have the same choices and we should not all be forced to. But this through line goes, okay, this baby, maybe this baby will be addicted or incarcerated or unemployed or have mental illness. And all those have assignments, like cost, like, oh, like we know, we've heard for years and years, oh, it costs this much to house an incarcerated person, right? Oh, they decide it all by third grade test scores. All of this narrative has been in place for so long because now they're gonna dial back the prison population in terms of creating an open air prison because they can just incarcerate you with your digital identity. So this is all, part, so in all of it is tied into the smart contracts. The smart contract would be between your, the, the, the nurse practitioner who's doing your wellness appointment and linking it into your blockchain health record like all of these layers and then your future rights and privileges may depend on something that like happened before you were born or something that happened to you 10 years ago that's already labeled you on a permanent distributed ledger that shapes how you can function in society with one another and with the built environment because now we're looking at geofencing because some of these smart contracts are going to literally be run from outer space by satellites. And so when you, like Jason said, try to get the Uber, try to open the door, try to go to the grocery store, try to access the smart internet of things bike, it's all going to be predicated on w what your contractual relationship is. And you may have 50 of them a day. And all of that data gets then fed back into your profile, right? Like, oh, you tried to rent the bike, but you knew you were allowed to rent the bike. So we, we check that, that's on your permanent record. You know, and it's, it's very insidious because it's framed as liberation, right? It's framed as convenience, but all of the data is then fitted into your profile to say, okay, well, if you end up like with mental illness, like this is your past profile and then it informs everything moving forward.